When I finally got an opportunity to talk again with Pastor Hines, I shared with him what I was seeing and experiencing. What astounded me was that this man wasn't surprised by anything I said. I didn't expect him to be, but his nonchalant attitude was quite disturbing to me, especially since all of this was new to me. But for him, it was just another walk in the park. So, as I'm explaining to Pastor Hines the things I'm seeing, he's frankly too busy answering his phone and doing paperwork. It gets to the point again where this spirit of offense starts to come upon me. I say to him, Pastor Hines, I know you're busy, but I'm talking to you, and these things are disturbing me. I really want to discuss this with you. Imagine a scene. He's seated behind his desk. On his right-hand side is a computer. On his left-hand side is a stack of paperwork. And Pastor Hines had one of those gigantic day calendars that you lay on top of your desk and write appointments on. He looks up at me and says, Listen, I know that what you're going through is difficult, but I'm not the one sending you through it. God is, and if God is for you, who can be against you? Then he puts his head back down and goes back to work. Now pause right here. Let me say this. At this point in time, I'm in a position where I'm working directly with Pastor Hines, but not working directly for Pastor Hines, if that makes sense. I'm a member of the church. He's chosen me to help him out with certain things, but I'm not getting compensated for this work. So now, and the reason why I share that with you is because I want you to look at it from my standpoint. I'm going to these meetings, spending time doing all these things, and for me to be greeted and for my cares and concerns to be brushed off like that was a tad bit offensive. So again, I tell him, Pastor Hines, listen, I understand what you're saying, but I really need to discuss this with you again. He pauses, looks up at me and says, listen, here's what you're experiencing. Everywhere you go, you're seeing the spirits behind the altars that exist inside the businesses. Therefore, those spirits see and know that you see them. So you're afraid and nervous because the spirit realm is wide open to you, and they are aware of the fact that you can see them. Pastor Hines looks at me dead in the eyes and says, No. So my Bible says, For the Lord didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So are you sitting here telling me that you're afraid of what you're seeing? because if you're afraid, then you've received a spirit that is not of God. Then he puts his head down and starts to work again. The relationship between the two of us and the dynamic that we exist in was always fluctuating. I understood that. However, I've never seen it vacillate and fluctuate so rapidly and so quickly. It was almost as if I was having a conversation with two different people. And moments later, I would truly come into the understanding that part of who was talking to me was Pastor Hines. The other part of who was talking to me was the Holy Spirit himself inside Pastor Hines because I loop him again. And I said, yes, I am afraid. And I'm worried about what I'm seeing and I'm just concerned about what I'm doing altogether. You keep sending me to these meetings. I keep meeting these people, but I don't understand what you want from me. I don't make any decisions. I'm not officially working for you. I kind of lay into Pastor Hines heavy duty and the next thing you know he sits back in his chair, his shoulders roll back, he squares up to me and looks me dead in my eyes and says, the Lord has chosen you to do work for his kingdom. Nobody told you that when you were chosen and called it would be easy. Nobody told you that it wouldn't be scary. Nobody told you that it would be simple. When you look at each and every one of our forefathers who've been called and chosen by the Lord, their lives have been difficult. Things have been confusing. There have been times when those men should have been afraid. But if you read carefully what's in your Bible, you will see that they were not. And the reason why they were not afraid is because they knew who was with them. Again, I say to you, the Lord did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Listen to me the way he said it the second time, the way those words came out of his mouth, the look in his eyes, his body posture, his movement, it was completely and totally different than the very first time he said it. As those words came out of his mouth, he exuded both confidence and anger all at the same time. And I realized right then and there, I wasn't going to make it any further on this particular point, trying to express myself to him. The best thing I could do is figure out what he needed from me next. So I asked him, okay, Pastor Hines, fine. Is there anything else you need from me? Do you need me to do something for you? 
He reaches over and grabs a stack of paperwork, a stack of file folders the size of his hand, and hands them to me. You know, the manila folders with the metal tabs that poke up and then you press them down and slide it over for legal documents. He hands me a palm full of those and says, these are the projects that are coming up. I need you to go to these meetings and let me know what you think about them. I won't be going to any more of these meetings. I'm turning this over to you. I need to plan another missionary trip. Understand, listen, and understand all of my worries, fears, and concerns are coming from my involvement in business with Pastor Hines. So I take those files and go over into his break room and sit down and look through them. And as I lay them out on a table and open them up, the first thing that comes to my attention is that it is the same group of investors over and over again. And what I mean by the same group of investors, it's the same company. And then this is what I need you to understand. When I say this, when I say it's the same group of investors on each and every document, on each and every proposal, each and every plan, there are multiple people who participate, but there's one company that's on each and every one of them. And it stood out like a sore thumb. How can one organization be involved with all these projects? They're the one consistent thing outside of Pastor Heinz's organization. They're the only other thing that's consistent on each and every art project. Fast forward a week later, the very first meeting comes up for a project in another state. This is for a disaster relief contract. I drive to the meeting and guess who's there sitting at the table? The same person I saw at the previous meeting. The one with the spirit that was in the room with him. Understand, this is a whole new project, a different state, and yet this guy is there. The meeting was projected to be six hours long. We go through the first three hours and then take a lunch break. They provide some food. I grab my sandwich and chips, trying to find a quiet spot to think. He walks over, sits down across from me and says, huh, looks like you and I are going to be bumping heads on these things moving forward. Pause right here. If you are a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ, understand that those who work for the kingdom of darkness know who they work for. They are unashamed and have a different set of rules. They get rewarded for lying, deceit, and leading people to hell. In our kingdom, we worship in spirit and truth, aiming to bring people to our Father for eternal life. Don't be mistaken, this is the battle we are dealing with. Back to the story. As we sit at the table, he asks, how long have you been working with Pastor Hines? I'm an ex-cop and I recognize the start of an interrogation. The key is not to give away information, so I deflect, asking him about his thoughts on the project instead. This starts a verbal cat and mouse game of deflection and redirection, noticing a red string tied under his watch on his wrist. I inquire about it. His demeanor changes. He looks me dead in the eyes. You and I both know we play for two different teams. We're here for our sides. We don't have to battle. We could just agree not to bid against each other on these jobs. He proposes a deal, one for you, one for me. As tempting as it sounds, the Holy Spirit reminds me, the devil is a liar. I decline the offer and the atmosphere shifts. He leaves the table and I'm prompted by the Holy Spirit to go to my car and pray. I look over and he's praying to his God as I start praying to mine. Distractions flood my mind, but as I persist, I notice him staring at me, realizing he knows I'm praying. I wonder if angels can counteract his demons, and as I pray, the distractions cease. An hour and more pass by in prayer. Suddenly, the car radio turns on to a preacher speaking of godly speed and patience. It's a clear sign from God, reassuring me in my task. Finally, the Holy Spirit instructs me to return to the meeting, which has ended. They thought I had left, but they hand me a folder with the entire presentation and agree to follow up. Leaving the meeting, I feel foolish for all the praying, but it's only later I realize the importance of that act. Have you ever felt like what God wanted you to do was foolish? That day when I returned home, that is what I felt. Understand that I drove to this meeting for free, spent my own money, took time away from my family, only to sit in the parking lot and pray the majority of the day. That night, he astral projected into my dreams and we were back in that meeting and he wanted to talk. I think he was under the impression that he would astral project into my dream to influence me. 
He was unaware that the Lord had trained me on such things. We are sitting at the table and he is talking to me, telling me that I will back off of every contract given to me by Pastor Hens, and I'm just looking at him. Then he says, and, now you know when a person says the word and in the English language, it means they are adding something to their statement. However, in the dream realm, this word and came out of his mouth like a chain and started to wrap around my wrist as he says, and your God can't help you. Now that right there pissed me off and in that dream, I slapped him. I'm talking about a Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee, street corner pimp slap. The look on his face when he realized that I was aware of what he was doing was one of shock. Then he started to blink in and out like he was trying to leave and I grabbed him and I said to him, my God is able to do all things and you will not insult him again. That is when his spirit friend showed up and grabbed my hand, forcing me to let him go. When I awoke from the dream, I fell on my face and prayed, asking God to send angels after that spirit for interfering. This was the start of one-on-one -on -one warfare between me and J.C. Reed, a man that would turn out to be the gatekeeper for a Gnostic demonic organization that spanned three states. Stop right here and let me explain something to you. Gnosticism was a second century religious movement claiming that salvation could be gained through a special form of secret knowledge. Let me ask you a question biblically in the garden. What did Satan tempt Eve with? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, am I correct? Those who are Gnostics claim to have special knowledge. I have seen it recently here on YouTube in this field. However, when you look at their lives, they have zero fruit to bear as a result of this knowledge. They are arrogant, shark-eyed, and emotionally unstable. None of this is of the Lord our God. So, you know, based on the results and the actions, what God they serve. Just as chaos ensued after Adam and Eve came into the knowledge of good and evil, when you as a Christian seek after knowledge without the Spirit of God leading you, your life will quickly move towards chaos. I say this because, as I squared off with Mr. J.C. Reed, I started to notice things about him that show exactly what spirit he served.